All right, thanks very much and, um, for that introduction. So what I thought I would do today is to give you a snapshot of what we're doing here in Quebec uh, with the Cartagen study. And what we're going to be trying to do with this presentation is give you an overview of what we built here. Um, we've been working very hard for this last uh, seven years or so in uh, building a population laboratory or, or biobank, whatever what you want to call it. Um, so I'm going to give you an oversight of that program today. Uh, and then I'm going to focus a little bit on some of the genomics uh, utilizations coming directly from my lab at St. Justine Hospital and from the research team. I'm not going to have time to talk about all of these projects. I'll probably talk about two of them. And some of this uh, work that we're also going to be talking about today is uh, unpl unpublished, and uh, uh, you're going to get a snapshot of it in terms of look, I'm just trying to look at gene and environmental determinants of gene expression and phenotypes, and then I'm going to give you an idea of where we're going uh, with the program as well. Um, so. When thinking about Cartagen, and when I first came on board Cartagen back in, feels like forever, uh, 2008 uh, or so, uh, one of the things that I wanted to make sure was done with this program is that we built enough resource such that we could not only facilitate doing studies like GWAS, which is a very straightforward and simple sort of association. When I say straightforward and simple, I mean how we do the statistics and so on. It's not so straightforward in terms of getting the resources uh, in order to facilitate the, those types of studies. Anyway, to do studies, say, looking at associations between genotype and phenotype, which is what you see on the left. Does this work? I guess I can only point in one direction. Um, so I'm going to point over here. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we also are able to capture enough biologics um, and other data so that we can also understand how, say, other factors like gene expression might change in the population, how that might be associated with, say, the exposome, for lack of a better term, maybe the environment. Um, allow other researchers, we don't do this kind of work, but uh, we were just talking earlier at Coffee about how we want to be there for people to do metabolomics research, proteomics research, et cetera. And, once that data is collected, you know, you can utilize and integrate all that information to pot potentially give you more power to capture underlying determinants of subphenotypes or disease. So that was the idea. We wanted to be more than just, say, a straight-up GWAS cohort, so we made a point of capturing lots of biologics and lots of phenotypes and lots of other kinds of data to facilitate a broad range of studies. Now, one of the things that I want to make sure it gets across from this presentation today is that this is not the Awadala cohort. This is a public utilization cohort. It is Cartagen, and it's there for public use. Right? We have mechanisms for access that have been in place, and we've been open for business, if you like, since 2010, um, after the first participant walked in the door uh, in our first phase of recruitment. And so this is, this is the website, or the web page. It's constantly under re, uh, revision and being constantly rebuilt because there's lots of activities that are continuing to go on um, since 2010, and I'll talk a little bit about that in the first part of this talk. So this is how you would find us, um, and something, this, is, this may be the only French in the presentation, which is a shame because we are in Quebec, but nonetheless, uh, Access Share Share is your front line, if you like. Uh, for having access to the data or the biologics, um, and that would almost put you in touch with Susanna, who you've already seen quite a lot of today, who is our, uh, our access officer. Um, so, one of the general missions of building and developing a program like Cartagen is that it is a population laboratory, and that we've captured lots of information about, uh, about, uh, from, from the participants, much of it self-reported, uh, self-reported health and lifestyle information, that's usually uh, questionnaires. Uh, in our first phase of recruitment, every participant came to one of 12 clinical or 13 clinical sites throughout Quebec. So we were able to capture a lot of physical, physiological measures from these participants as well as biologics. I'll, sh I'll show you some info the data we captured from them. Um, so that we can do these types of studies, looking at uh, genomics, trying to understand the relationship between, say, ethnicities and genetics uh, with regard to health. Uh, also endophenotypes, lifestyle. Um, through uh, questionnaires that we uh, provide to participants, we can also capture environment data, but through also data linkage to administrative databases, we can also capture environment data as well. And we do also have the means to link to government and administrative health data. To get, you've heard already this morning about uh, uh, access to e-health records or uh, electronic health records from our participants as well. Um, so these, this is a map of Quebec, so you are in, most of you are from Montreal, but for those who are not, this is where you're sitting. 
Um, and uh, most of our, it is a population cohort. We wanted to collect participants at a frequency that reflect the population demographic. So most of our participants come from, I lost my pointer, oh, there it is, from Montreal. Um, so that's why this circle is bigger here. Um, uh, we also included participants from Quebec, the Saguenay region, Lac Saint-Jean. You're going to hear quite a bit about Saguenay, Lac Saint-Jean today. Um, and in our second phase of recruitment, we also opened things up to Gatineau and Trois Rivières. Uh, we've gone through two phases of recruitment for the cohort. The first phase of recruitment collected 20,000 participants, all aged 40 to 69 years of age. You heard about this through uh, John Spinelli uh, when discussing the CPTP project. And as I mentioned, we've got health questionnaire information, biologics, uh, uh, physical measures. Since our first phase of collection, our first uh, recruitment phase, we've also gone back and collected nutrition and environment data. We've also had a second wave of recruitment. We recruited another 20,000 people. That ended literally two or three weeks ago, and we managed to get another 20,000 people, so we're now at 40,000 people. And as John mentioned earlier, we are part of the CPTP program, which has collected, and this thermometer is a little out of date. We've, we've already bust this thermometer. We're already over 300,000 participants. So we've met our mandates for all of our recruitments, and now, we're, as I said, we've been open for business for some time. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what we have. Um, oh, there's more French here, that's great. Uh, so uh, this was, a, Cartagen, as Tom mentioned earlier, was an initial project funded by Genome Canada. The lead PIs, were, I believe, were Tom and Barton Oppers and Claude Leberge, who was here also today, was part of that program. Um, and uh, so it was, it was, it was substantial investment from the, from the government in terms of getting this database set up. And as was mentioned by John earlier, we, have, we did our initial recruitments through, by getting personal information from the RAMQ. Um, and through those consents, then we invited people to those 12 clinical sites that I mentioned before. People gave biologics. Those are all sitting in a biobank up in northern Quebec. Uh, that's Saguenay for the locals. Um, and as we've said before, uh, the program has been open for business for some time now. We've got over 40 different research projects exploiting the database and the biologics, et cetera. Um, since we've been open. So um, we, we perceive that as, as quite a success for what is effectively a young cohort. Um, these are the physical measures that we collected um, from each of the 20,000, say, phase A participants initially. Um, so uh, we've got your classic uh, anthropometric measures, uh, height, uh, BMI, et cetera, bioimpedance measures, grip strength, measures of bone density, lung function, blood pressure, measures of arterial stiffness, uh, 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 Etc. EKGs, and, and the list goes on. We don't have enough. This could go down to the floor in terms of the amount of information we collected from these participants. Um, we've also got done CBCs on all of our participants as well, so general hematology. Um, so for every participant, we have usual counts of neutrophils. We also have uh, measures of, say, glycated hemoglobin from every participant from blood. Uh, from serum, we have all of these bio, all of this biochemistry measured as well. And as I mentioned, this is a snapshot of some of the macro physical measures we've collected from our participants as well. Um, there's little risk for samples to be depleted, um, biologic samples. We took about 110 mils, 105 mils of blood from every participant, which is not a small amount. Um, those samples are fractionated in various ways and frozen separately so that we can pull out samples repeat, uh, and provide them to researchers without thawing, dethawing the base sample um, so that, again, we're going to be losing very little samples in terms of or destruction through that type of process. So we have blood. This is an idea from of the kinds of ways that we have the blood. We have serum. We have plasma. We have urine. We have samples uh, in DMSO, so for particular, in particular for individuals who are interested in looking at cell-specific effects from blood, um, those can be used there. We also have blood in tempest tubes, sorry, um, here, which, which is like a PAX tube. It has uh, RNA later in it, and you can use that for gene expression studies, in which I'm going to be talking about ad nauseum for the next 20 minutes or so. Um, these are our recruitment rates. So this was our recruitment rates for phase A. I don't have recruitment rates yet for phase B because we just closed. Um, but this is what gives you an idea of what the level of participation is like in Quebec. 
and participation rates are generally fairly high relative to other programs internationally. So on average in Quebec, we saw about 20 to 25 percent participation rates, and that varies from region to region in Quebec. Uh, some of our highest participation rates were actually in northern Quebec in the Saguenay region. And that might be because in, up in the northern region of Saguenay, they're exposed to a lot of genetic studies. Uh, there's a, potentially a sub-founding, uh, isolated population effect happening there, and geneticists have been using, studying that region for the past 30 years or so. Um, Montreal is down here, and this is our heat map of recruitment rates. Uh, we do see variation in terms of recruitment rates. Uh, uh, from region to region, but we did try to keep recruitment such that we captured 1% of each three-digit postal code resolution before we shut down a particular postal code. Um, nevertheless, it was tough in some parts. Uh, Anglophone parts of Montreal Island are the toughest parts to recruit from. Um, uh, young males in particular from Anglophone regions. I actually thought it might be fun to put that Cartagen sign that you have there on one of the hockey boards during the playoffs, and then the, the staff said no. Um, and maybe we thought, thought, thought the funders wouldn't appreciate it if they saw Cartagen at the Bell Center. Um, it's not that expensive, actually. I did look into it. Um, so anyway, uh, we did manage to hit our target numbers. And uh, so this gives you an idea of our participation rates. Uh, these are an idea, it gives you an idea of the incidence, uh, not the incidence rates, the prevalence rates of uh, coming out of the Cartagen cohort in terms of number of diseases or frequencies of diseases. Again, as in a cohort, a population cohort, um, you'll see that, you know, cardiometabolic traits are the most, uh, more, or diseases self-reported in this case, are the most frequent. Um, there are a number of cancers, there are a number of neurological disorders, but here again, uh, you got the numbers here for, say, type 2 diabetes and so on. We've done the measure, we've done the comparisons to things like StatScan, comparisons to other cohorts, and what we're capturing generally in Quebec follows what we expect in terms of the population as well. Um, and again, of course, we've heard about this a couple of times today already. Uh, we've got instant, uh, we have information about uh, frequencies of comorbidities. Uh, so this just gives you an idea of the breakdown. This comes from the phase A data, so the first 20,000 participants. So of course, a number of participants, say 23% of, of the cohort, are reporting no disease. Um, 26 are reporting one of those conditions that I mentioned before in the histogram. 20.2% are reporting two. And it goes on uh, in terms of the, so you have some people who are reporting su six um, uh, potential disorders. So comorbidity information is something we're able to pull from this type of data. We're also able to even get the kind of this kind of similar kind of information for drug utilization as well. It's actually quite astounding how many participants in the cohort are taking, say, five drugs or more. Uh, uh, and uh, that might be, that's, that's important information as we discuss uh, drug utilization and the effectiveness Okay, so that uh, gives you a snapshot of what we got. Um, like I said, this, isn't, this is a cohort that is open for business and it's open for access. And I'm going to show you some, mechanism, some other mechanisms for uh, how, do you, how you can access it. Uh, what I wanted to do now is touch on uh, some snapshots of some studies that we've been doing. I'm a geneticist uh, trained in population genetics. And I'm going to give you an idea of some of how we, as my lab, so I have to come in get into the cohort just like you would have to get into the cohort, go through the th same approval process and do these types of studies. So we've been doing some work uh, mostly focusing on the French-Canadian segment of the cohort. Um, we've been sequencing with Illumina, um, RNA-seq, which is a fairly high, RNA sequencing, a fairly high coverage, gen generally getting anywhere from 60 to 80 million reads per individual. So very high depth information. Uh, we've done some genotyping already on the cohort as well. I'm going to show you some of the information about how we're integrating some of the genomics with the RNA sequencing to give you a snapshot of the population genetics of the population. Um, so one of the basic questions a population geneticist might ask is what is the genetic uh, allele frequency um, in the population in Quebec? How, does, how has that changed? Uh, Pop Quebec was founded, say, two, three hundred years ago. Uh, by anywhere from 7,000 to 10,000 settlers from a larger population in France, and has actually exponentially grown since then. We're about 8 million people here. So that's actually, it's actually not that easy to model that computationally. So we went from, say, an effective pop a population size or a bottleneck of 7,000 to 8 million. Right? And that's going to, we expect, to have an impact on the allele frequency distribution in the population. So those are the basic questions we initially wanted to ask, and we also wanted to ask how does it, so one way to ask that is compare French Canadians to the French, right, from European French. 
So again, these are some of the basic kind of expectations. Um, and so what we're showing you here on the left is, well, what we're showing you in this picture is a publication that was published by, by postdocs, uh, Ferran Casals and Alan Hodgkinson, who have either gone on to faculty positions or are about to go on to faculty positions in Europe. And uh, what we're showing you here on the left is sort of what we call the joint site, and I say jo we, uh, this was actually developed by somebody in the audience, uh, Simone Gravel, uh, jo the joint site frequency spectrum of allele frequencies of French Canadians relative to the French. And so one of the things that we're just comparing, we're going to show you here, is that in red we're looking at uh, French Canadians and in blue the French. And w this is giving you an indication for two classes of sites that I think this is synonymous and missense mutations in the population that the French Canadians have an excess, you get that from that, looking at that red bar in the histogram here, of rare variants relative to Western Europeans. And that again follows expectations. Now, we can take that a little bit further, and we can ask what, is, what are the quality of those mutations, right? How many of those mutations, if you like, are potentially happening at conserved portions of the genome? And if they're happening at conserved portions of the genome, potentially they have, might have more impact, if you like, phenotypic impact or disease impact. And does that differ between French Canadians and French? And generally, that's what we're showing you here, is that um, generally, population geneticists like to look at the ratio of non-synonymous or protein ch changes to silent changes. So French Canadians have more protein changes relative to silent changes compared to the French. Um, the, most of those rare variants that we were telling you about before that are occur accumulating in French Canadians relative to the French are happening at perhaps more conserved elements of the genome. So again, there's been a shift, if you like, in a very short amount of time, like only about 300 years, and the overall frequency spectrum of variation in, the, in this population, the French Canadian population, relative to the ancestral population, if you like. So we think there's been an accumulation, a relative proportion of more damaging mutations accumulating in French Canadians relative to the French. Now that, just want to be clear, that's not saying that there are more mutations, it's relative proportion. In fact, because the population is smaller, there actually le there's actually less diversity in the population, but the mutations that come in have perhaps more impact or that are still in the population. Um, okay, so that gives us a snapshot of what the genetic diversity in the population looks like in Quebec. And so we've been taking this a little bit further at the population level and thinking about how is that variation that I just described distributed across the genome. Okay, so now we're just thinking about the French Canadians and comparing them now to, say, data from the thousand genomes. And 1,000 genomes, or some people in this room who have been deeply involved, and we've been involved in 1,000 genomes as well, has collected both low coverage and high coverage quality data uh, from a large number of individuals and the thousands of individuals now. And what we're exploiting here is the high coverage exome data, so just data from the coding regions of the genome. And what we wanted to ask is, are mutations that are potentially damaging distributed across the genome in a random manner, or is there other, some other mechanism that's controlling how those mutations are distributed? So we were looking at how recombination um, uh, was associated with that distribution. And generally what we're showing you here, I'm just going to go through this really fast, is that in cold spots, recombining cold spots of the human genome, we see an excess of damaging mutations relative to non-cold spots. Okay, that's one thing. And that excess differs from population to population as well. So first of all, so FCQ stands for French Canadians, uh, red is Europeans, uh, Asians is ASN, and Africans are in blue. So if you like, it goes from smaller to larger populations. And this odds ratio is just comparing data uh, from low recombining regions to high recombining regions. And so what we're seeing is that there's an excess of potentially damaging mutations or rare variants that are potentially damaging accumulating across all populations in low recombining regions compared to high recombining regions. Now the reason that's important is because that gives us an idea of that where we should be considering looking when we're thinking about trying to capture uh, mutations that are going to have impact on fitness or phenotype. Um, we can do this for mutations that, are not all, that have also been associated with disease. Uh, you can go to the ClinVar database, uh, which is, a, if you like, a repository of all mutations or mutations that have been implicated in a disease, and ask the same question. Where are those mutations accruing? Are they accruing in low recombining regions versus high recombining regions? And they are. Okay? 
Um, and so that's generally what we're showing here. Particu particularly, we see that when we're looking at rare ClinVar mutations, which we're seeing here, versus ClinVar common mutations. The odds ratio is above one, again, telling us that those mutations are accumulating in cold spots versus hot spots. Okay? Okay, so we went from looking at French Canadian population genetics, thinking again just about French Canadian genomes in general, thinking about how mutations are distributed across the genome. Now, the questions I'm going to start asking are how does French Canadian genetics vary within Quebec as well? Um, I mentioned to you earlier that we think, in, we know that there is some population structure. Uh, within Quebec, uh, in the Saguenay, northern Quebec region. We think there might be a sub-founding population uh, that might have an impact on genetics and disease accumulation there. So we're going to start thinking about that now as we start uh, interrogating the data at a greater resolution. So as I mentioned before, we recruited from Montreal, Quebec City, and this is Saguenay here in northern Quebec. It's about a, I forgot how long it takes to fly there. It's about an hour and a half flight maybe um, to Saguenay. From it's a five, okay, yeah, so that's about an hour flight, okay. Um, it's not a drive I do, <laughs> very, very often anyway. Um, so we, we've, taking the data we have within the Cartagen program, we started looking at the genotypes, so the uh, Omni 2.5 genotypes that I mentioned before. And uh, what we were able to capture is that there's a geographic climb in genetic variation in the population that almost follows the St. Lawrence River. Um, which is, again, quite astounding that we have this evolution of genetic diversity in the population, again, happening within a fairly short time scale. Um, so on the left, you have what we, our principal component analyses, looking at the genetic variation and how that's distributed across the population. And we just actually had some fun with this because we do have information at a three-digit postal code for each one of these participants. So we can actually map this information at that three-digit postal code resolution. So you kind of get the, a, a kind of a geographic snapshot of that. So we're able to capture that geographic line. And that geographic line also appears to be associated with the level of identity by descent in the population as well. So for lack of a better term, uh, well, identity by descent, quick, very quickly, how related you are. So participants on average that we capture in the Cartesian cohort, say coming from the Saguenay region, so the northern region up here, um, on average, any pair of individuals, uh, say 30% of all pairs of individuals will be second and third degree cousins, which is quite high, um, relative to Montreal, which is around the same, say, North American average, right? It's around, uh, I would say, uh, that same percentage, 20 to 30%, would be th uh, third and fourth degree cousins. So that is closer to the North American average. So you have higher degrees of relatedness up here. You also have higher degrees of homozygosity. Um, uh, yeah, okay. And uh, so we get that kind of information from genotyping. Now, we've also been doing RNA sequencing, as I mentioned to you before. And so this is data coming from about 1,000 individuals, which we've captured at high depth coverage. And again, we're seeing a similar geographic line, where people here um, have similar, more, more similar uh, gene expression signatures than people if I were to take, compare somebody from Saguenay versus Montreal. So what you have here on this left table are the number of genes that are significantly differentially expressed between, say, Montreal or Quebec, or Montreal versus Saguenay, or Quebec versus Saguenay. So again, we're seeing genotype differences as we move across the population. We're seeing how genes are expressed are also varying um, across the region or across the population as well. Okay? That might be genetically driven. That might be environmentally driven. So we're going to show you a few snapshots of what, uh, what we think might be happening. So one of the things that, you know, some of the, the data that I'm talking about right now actually comes from selecting 1,000 people, the RNA sequencing data, from 1,000 people. I selected them based on Framingham risk scores. And what I wanted to do was take initially extremes of Framingham risk scores so that I could potentially capture genetic or gene expression signatures that can distinguish uh, potential cardiometabolic traits, right? When you're, when you're a geneticist, that's what you do, is you look at the tails of distribution so that you're more likely to capture an effect of substantial size. Um, and so everything I was just talking about before in terms of genotyping, gene expression, or whatever is coming from that. As I mentioned already, we also have complete blood counts for everybody as well. So we can look at RNA sequencing from, from those individuals. And the way we're integrating some of this data is in this kind of what we're now becoming sort of a classic utilization or tool for integrating genotype and gene expression data to look at, say, environment or phenotype. And that is EQTL analysis. 
Right? And this on the, on, on your, on the projection is, if you're, is effectively an EQTL. So what we're going to be capturing is when we're thinking about a particular genotype, whether you're homozygous AA or BB or heterozygous AB, we want to be able to capture whether any of those gene expression signatures that are differentially expressed between regions or phenotypes is actually genetically controlled. Right? And this would be a classic case. So this would be a, a very additive effect where the, the heterozygotes is in, 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 the mid, in the middle between the two homozygotes. And if there's a genotype by environment interaction, you're going to see perturbations. They'll still be significant. You're still going to see interactions between expression and genotypes, but they will change depending on the environment. Okay? So that's what we're going to be looking for. Uh, first of all, before I show you that, um, this is looking at gener uh, generally exploratory data analysis of the gene expression data that we have. Um, these are the first principal components, one and two. And generally, what's explaining most of the differences in gene expression that we have in the population, not surprisingly, is going to be gender, cell counts. We can look at this because we have the cell count data for every participant. Then region. So region is city. Okay, so Montreal, Quebec, Montreal. That's third in the list of all the variables we have. We have 500 variables, and just stick them in there. Region is the is third most important. Central augmentation index is fourth. Central augmentation index is a measure of arterial stiffness. It comes from the Sigma Core tool that we use for measuring uh, stiffness of arteries. And that comes up fourth in terms of explaining differential expression in the data. Okay? So that gives us some kind of guide as what we should be looking for when we're thinking about explanatory variables or of gene expression in the population. So if you're not familiar with these kind of circus plots, um, this is, an, is effectively a GWAS, uh, genotype-wide association, but drawn in a circle. Um, and what we're trying to capture here are the EQTLs that I showed you before that are explaining gene expression. So the genotypes that are explaining gene expression that are interacting with the region collected, so by city, right? And these are giving you an, the, kind of the idea of the numbers. And so we're actually able to capture that there is a substantial genetic by gene expression impact on how genes are expressed and differentially expressed in the population. So that's circus plot number one. And we can do the same thing for arterial stiffness. Right? So with arterial stiffness, we're actually also capture, capturing um, data which is identifying new genetic factors associated uh, with the phenotypic variables that we have here. This is an, and one thing I want to mention is there have been GUI studies that have looked at arterial stiffness. They have almost all failed uh, in terms of capturing any sort of genetic marker associated with that trait. Um, by integrating with these relatively small numbers compared to GWAS, by integrating the gene expression data with the genotype data, we're able to capture new factors, genetic factors that haven't been captured before. We've been able to replicate this in other cohorts. We've been able to replicate this uh, with other ethnicities in our cohort as well. So um, again, it really just comes down to what I'm, one of the messages that I'm trying to get across with this presentation is that by integrating multiple, omic, multiple layers of data, whether it's omic or phenotypes or whatever, we're able to capture new targets or new factors. Um, I don't know how I'm doing for time. I got one minute, oh, I got two minutes, great. I just warned everybody at the beginning of this conference not to go over time, so anyway. Um, just, well, these are the last couple of slides, and I just wanted to showcase that uh, all the data that we have presented, that I presented here today, is going to be made available through a new Genome Canada uh, funded uh, center. Uh, it's called the Canadian Data Integration Center. Um, it includes partners from Cartagen, uh, funders from, from Genome Canada, uh, partners with OICR and Maelstrom. These are our general uh, reasons for being. Uh, or provide ready use access to data sets like the data that I just presented today uh, to facilitate collaborations across, whoops, collaborate cohorts um, uh, through my partners. They, they include Lincoln Stein at the OICR, uh, Isabel Fortier, and Vincent Ferretti. Uh, we're going to be develop, helping build portals uh, for access to these types of data in other co uh, cohorts. Um, at CPTP, we're now collecting uh, genotypes from across the region as well, so I wanted to mention that. And when that data is available, we'll be making it available through these types of portals as well. So that's it. I'm just going to thank a few people. Um, this is the, the lab. They're, in, they're on their way to Toronto. Um, they're in the bus stop. Um, the, all the omics I don't get to do anymore, of course. Um, uh, it was all, uh, these are publications uh, and uh, done by my former postdoc, Alan Hodgkinson, or he's not former yet, but he's going to be soon. Uh, Julie Hussain, who is a former student and now with Peter Donnelly at Wellcome Trust. 
and Yusuf Idagdur uh, was instru instrumental in developing all the tools uh, for the RNA seq as well. And again, I want to uh, thank as well the Cartagen team, both past and present. And this is not the most up to date picture, but of course, um, they're instrumental in, of course, gathering this enormous data resource. And as I said, I encourage you all to, to, uh, to take a look at the website, and hopefully, there'll be something there for you. Thanks very much. So thank you for this excellent presentation. So we have time for one or two questions. There's some microphone in the room if some people want to ask questions. In the meantime, while people go to the microphone, you've been showing the value of integrating, like you said, the genetic with the, micro, the expression data. Do you foresee that you could put also proteomic, metabolomics? Have you started to do this? or? We have started, uh, we, not in terms of our analysis yet. Um, we actually, okay, well, we have, but um, I haven't read the full data yet. Okay. The, uh, we have started doing some work with the urine samples that we have. Uh, what we're trying to do, even if the genotyping and gene expression, you know, the gene expression by these standards is a lot of samples, but genotyping, not a lot. But we're trying to build within at least our medium-sized core is a, a, a deeply characterized group of individuals. So from the urine samples, we've been looking at albuminuria, uh, microalbumina, and, and so on. So uh, we have, we do think that, so that gives us... Like a proof of concept yeah, type of... Yeah, exactly. Right. And I may have, you may have said it, but I may have missed it. Uh, did, are you having one-time sampling of blood or all that? Or is it like, could you do like longitudinal study? No, I'm, I'm glad you asked. So we're now just, we just got resources or funds from the funder, the federal funder, the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, to initiate uh, recontact. Okay. All right, so we're doing longitudinal recontact, if you like recontacts. We've already done some recontacts, like the nutrition and environment data that I mentioned very, very briefly. Uh, but now we're asking our participants to uh, give us an update on their health status. All right. We also do periodic recontact, uh, re periodic recontacts through the RAMQ as okay. well. So we'd like to make that more periodic mm -hmm. or more yeah. increase that frequency. Uh, but that's, I think, going to be of, of great value for, to researchers as well. Is there any question up front? Okay. Uh, great presentation, Philip. I have a question. So um, you showed um, the increased power of integrating transcription and uh, SNP data. And you're doing this, of course, on lymphocytes. So how much uh, of the EQTL information you think um, overlaps with other tissues? Are you capturing 80% or 60% of the information? Or how much are you losing? <laughs> So I think that's a great question. I think, um, and that's still going to be the subject of more research. Uh, my feelings is we're probably capturing 60% of effects, and that comes from previously published studies as well. But at the same time, uh, what we try to focus on here are things that we think are going to be more directly associated with blood, because that's where the, that's the tissue that we have as well. But I think with resources like GTEC, um, again, it's, you know, I think those are going to really illuminate how much we can cross tissue, ask those types of questions, if you like. But I think, you know, it's important to look at these things in blood, too, because we are trying, in some cases, find biomarkers, right? Oh, yeah. And I'm more likely going to be using blood as a biomarker than, say, than a liver biopsy or something. <laughs> like so, or brain, in your case. But the, so uh, I think we're, since we're a little bit behind schedule, we'll go to it. Thank you very much.